For those listening on Facebook, we are just about to begin our El Cajon City Council Candidates Forum for District 4. We are now live. And while we're waiting a minute or so for 7 o'clock to roll around, I just want to remind everybody that if you are not sure if you're registered to vote, sometimes people can get dropped off. It's a good idea to go to sdvote.com. Check on your registration. If you're not registered, you can register online. Everybody will be getting vote by mail ballots this year uh, due to COVID-19. And so um, when you get your ballot, you can either mail it in as early as possible, or there are going to be some super polling places and we'll be getting that list from the registrar of voters and publishing that, or you can go to sdvote.org to look it up. There won't be as many polling places as in the past. And so I guess that's the advantage of mailing in the ballot, but if you don't want to mail it, you can vote in person on election day by going to your polling place or dropping it off early. There will be several locations where you can drop it off in the days leading up to the election. So without further ado, we are ready to begin. So welcome everyone to our East County Magazine Candidate Forum for El Cajon's District 4. District 4 is the South Central portion of the city under the newly created districts. There are four candidates on your ballot. Three of them are, he are here tonight and it's my pleasure to welcome Councilman Phil Ortiz, Fair Housing Advocate Estela de los Rios, and Dunya Shaba, a professor and former defense contractor in Iraq. The fourth candidate is Billy Thigpen, and he actually informed us yesterday that he is suspending his candidacy and he has actually endorsed Ms. De, de los Rios. So congratulations on that, Estella. Thank you. We thank all of our candidates for participating, the members of the public who sent in some great questions and the Facebook Journalism Project for underwriting our series of virtual candidate forums in this era of COVID-19 when we are not able to hold live forums. And without I also want to welcome our producer, John Sepulveda, who will also be our timekeeper. John, we couldn't do this without you. So thanks so much. Even though you're out of town and on vacation, we appreciate you calling in and, and helping us out on this. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Great. Yeah, El Cajon is the Valley of Opportunity. And so we're very excited to hear from these three candidates about their ideas for a better El Cajon. And so without further ado, let's move to opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes to tell us all about yourselves, your qualifications and accomplishments, and what you hope to do to accomplish if you are elected. Let's start with Councilman Ortiz, the incumbent. Thanks, Miriam. And thanks again for hosting this. Uh, you're the only news outlet that's doing it for a smaller district election. So I really appreciate the time and effort you guys are putting in, especially with your staff too. So uh, my name is Phil Ortiz. I'm a city councilman here in El Cajon. I was appointed to my seat in El Cajon about a year and a half ago. Um, East County native. Uh, I'm a small business owner as well. I own a company um, that does evaluations to see how energy efficient your home is, um, lowering people's electricity bills and being good stewards of the environment. Um, my priorities for El Cajon, as they've been since I've been a year on the, about a year on the city council, are public safety. We want to make sure that when you call for help, there's trained professionals that answer quickly and they get to you quickly as well. Um, homelessness, obviously no secret that El Cajon has its fair share of uh, people suffering from homelessness in our city. So we want to do our best to partner with nonprofits um, and help get them back into housing and lift them up out of their situation and um, financial stability. Uh, we want to make sure that the city is paying its bills on time, that we're not running up a credit card, and uh, we're being responsible with, with our citizens' uh, taxpayer, taxpayer money. Um, I have two children, uh, a three-year-old and a brand new five-month-old. I live with my wife, Rachel. And my son's name is Wesley, and my daughter's name is Jolene. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you again for hearing me out. Well, thank you very much. It's our pleasure to do this. We know that during COVID, it's tough for candidates to get out there and campaign the way that you normally would, or even the precinct walkers to, to walk around door to door. So we felt this is an important service to provide. Estella, let's hear from you next. And by the way, we will be rotating the answers so everybody will get a chance to be first, last, and in the middle. Um, Estella de los Rios, let's hear from you. First of all, thank you very much, Miriam, for this opportunity. I've been following all your forums and I'm really excited that you've been doing this. My name is Estela de los Rios. I'm currently the Executive Director of a Fair Housing Agency 
but I'm also a longtime resident of El Cajon, 40 years plus. I have three daughters, all went to Girls Mont High, to El Cajon School District, and now I currently have five grandchildren who are also enrolled in our school district here in El Cajon. As a community uh, member for uh, 40 years, I know the issues of housing and other issues that are facing residents. I am focused on the homeless situation. I know that this is a priority for many, but um, also a pressing and important issue for myself. Um, affordable housing is another concern. The rents are exorbitantly high and our seniors can't afford, afford them with fixed income. El Cajon has a huge low to moderate income population and we need to build more affordable housing units that could increase housing for the homeless as well and also increase economic growth. My other issue is public safety, which is a critical time at this, at this time in our nation. And specifically here in El Cajon, presently there's a lack of confidence and a lack of trust with community and that needs to be restored. We need a public safety program that invests not to harm the community, but to protect and serve. Having 30 years of management and after earning my BA in, in sociology from SDSU, I'm ready to extend my services to the city. My experience as a board member in multiple agencies around the county, locally, state, and nationally, um, I believe I have the experience to allow me to serve El Cajon residents. I have ex established networks um, that have addressed victims of human trafficking, hate crimes, and fair housing violations. And I'm very active in the community. I'm the president of the San Diego Fair Housing Alliance Board. I'm secretary for Latinos and Latinas Acción. Also board member of Justice Overcoming Boundaries, board member of Lemon Grove Thrive, East County Justice Coalition, and a member of National Fair Housing Alliance and a national member of World Without Exploitation. I also serve as the chair for the Welcome Newcomer Network of El Cajon, which addresses immigrant and refugee issues. And I've been recognized by several organizations, but the one that I'm most proud of is I've been chosen one out of 50 Latinos whose portrait hangs in the San Diego History Center. And I presently am excited because I serve now as a commissioner for the Leon L. Williams San Diego County Human Relations Commission 2020. And lastly, I don't know if I have any minutes left, but I strongly <laughs> believe in respect. John, let us know if we're getting close on time. Please. Okay. I strongly believe in respect, dignity, and human rights for all people, regardless of their race, age, uh, language, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, and disability. So thank you very much again for the opportunity, and I look forward to um, this forum tonight. Very good. Thank you so much, Estella. And Dunya Shaba, let's hear your opening remarks, please. Good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you, Marion, for allowing me to come aboard and be part of this and meet the other candidates because mm -hmm. I never met them before. So... Um, <laughs> I welcome you guys and um, thank you for, again, for allowing me to be here. Um, to give a little bit of background about myself, I'm originally from Iraq. I came when I was uh, 13 years old. I came to United States. I survived the Gulf War War in Iraq. I came in here, I attended high school. I've been residents of El Cajon 30 plus years. Um, I attended Valhalla High School. I graduated from San Diego State. I have a bachelor degrees in criminal justice. Um, I finished two years police academy here at Grossmont College. I finished master's in politics, emphasize on international conflict resolution. I finished another master's in higher education as a professor. Uh, I'm in the final phase of getting my dissertation in a PhD in uh, higher management and leadership of uh, higher education. I served in the military as a DOD contractor. I was a culture advisor for General Petraeus for about five years in Iraq. Uh, part of that duty taught me how to do uh, a lot of planning and future planning and operations and uh, so forth. I learned a lot through the military. Um, I became uh, in charge of a program, rehabilitation program inside a prison system in Iraq. Uh, I trained the Iraqi special forces as well, along with the uh, US Army. Um, then I came back here, I went to Middle East in the Gulf area. I was able to um, renovate private schools. Um, I was first to open uh, higher education uh, college in uh, Southern Iraq. Um, I promote education. I also um, did a lot of work while I was here. I did um, work for SART as a SART advocate uh, for crime prevention. I worked for uh, the hotline when I was in the school. So I was able to meet a lot of our um, 
victims in the, in the community here and worked hand in hand working with them on how to get them situated, how to put them through rehab programs and how, what needs that they needed. I also ran for a parliament member in uh, Iraq but I withdrew myself. I, I want to vote over there, but I withdrew myself because the corruptions that they were facing. Mm -hmm. So I just came back as of August of last year. Um, I came back, I, you know, I obtained all these degrees and I have, I speak four languages. I have a son and a granddaughter who's also in the Al Cajon school district. Um, my, my main goals here is to target not just homelessness and the housing increase because I saw a difference between me traveling back and forth. I see there's a lot of changes here in the community. Um, we need to promote more of a customer service, community relations, along with law enforcement. Um, we have a higher uh, Chaldean community in, in the area that we are in. And those Chaldeans are not, some of them, they need to be educated. So I'm promoting education as well, along with following law and order pretty much. And um, those are my, my primary goals right now. So, and promote education as well. I wanna, I wanna make sure that we promote education to a certain point so we can go internationally with other, um, Europe and Middle East. I've, I have traveled as well to 50 countries, got to see a lot of educational um, procedures along Europe, Middle East, and so forth. So I have a lot of educational background and I have 17 years of management experience. Wow. Thank you very much. And I think the people of El Cajon are actually very fortunate to have three obviously very experienced and well-qualified candidates running for this position. Um, let's start with our first round of questions. I'd like to ask first about the topic that's been so much in the news lately, which is racial justice and policing. El Cajon, like many cities across the US, has had recent protests over racial justice and policing issues. So I would like to ask each of you, what are your ideas for balancing concerns over racial injustices and police funding concerns versus the concerns by others over making sure that we have adequate police protection to control crime and protect the community? And uh, on this one, Estella, uh, your turn to go first. Thank you, Anne. Um, I believe this is an issue that urgently needs attention. Just yesterday, I participated in a memorial for Alfred Alongo, who four years ago uh, was unfortunately, um, it was killed on, on Broadway. And public safety is critical, especially because um, we can't continue to turn a blind eye or our backs on these life ending events by the, by the police, a law enforcement. Uh, I would like to implement a mental health response team and create a community oversight committee, a community oversight committee. Um, there is a PERT team, but it needs improvement because it's not functioning to the needs of the community. From what I understand, they have a long wait until they respond. And I believe that law enforcement needs more training in communication and mental health assessment. The community oversight committee would address the responsibility and accountability of law enforcement. And that's something that uh, we can create as a community. There needs to be communication in order for uh, the community to work together with uh, law enforcement. I think that that would be the best interest for everyone's public safety. When I was out um, walking the community, this was a an issue that concerned everyone because they were very um, distrusting. Um, they don't want to call the police department. They don't want to, uh, you know, be involved in anything. They, they're very fearful because of what happened four years ago, traumatized El Cajon, and there needs to be a change. At one time, there was a chief advisory board, which I served on. Uh, we only met maybe like twice. But I think that was a good start, but I would definitely create an open communication with community and law enforcement. That's crucial in order for community to trust again. And I believe this is not just a local issue, but a uh, national issue as well, since everyone is very aware of knowing all the, all the uh, killings across the nation with the injustices, when you mention racial injustice. Um, unfortunately, that occurs now. There's a history, there's a pattern, um, there's equi inequities. In, in social justice, and this is something that I'm very committed to, I'm very passionate about, and I will be addressing it. So thank you, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Junior, let's hear from you on the issue of racial justice and policing. Um, that's one of the things, graduating from a law enforcement uh, police academy of two years here at Nal Cajon, um, that was over 12, 13 years ago. Um, 
things, the standards were different. Uh, standards to become a police officer uh, has differentiated through time. Um, I believe that the law enforcement, a lot of the community here, they don't know what's their rights and what their constitution rights are is, and you know, like what their what can they practice, what can they do. So a lot of the community, as um, stated, they get scared of calling the police department. Um, they get scared that you know they're going to be arrested, they're going to be. Um, so there's a lot of crimes that's been committed here, especially domestic violence issue here with the community, the Chaldean community that I face. There's a lot of domestic violence issues where parents are scared. They think if they call the police that they're going to get arrested, um, they're going to lose their kids. So um, on the other hand, it's a two way street. The police department as well, there is not ongoing training. There is not, back in the days, they used to do a lot of community service and community relations where, um, you know, their programs would see their programs in the schools where they, you know, conduct a lot of programs for the children. Um, I don't see that as much. I don't see that there is a lot of interaction between the law enforcement as well as the community here. And I, I'm targeting toward, um, creating more programs, awareness program, as well as, as uh, giving knowledge and education to those community about what they, what constitution rights they have, what can they do, what can they not do. And at the same time, we need ongoing training for the police of, uh, officers, especially the new ones that are graduate, they come and they become on the field. And um, you see a lot of them are not well experienced as the previous officers have been, uh, or those who have been on the field for many years. So I'd like to target those two things. Thank you very much. And Councilman Ortiz, your views on racial justice and policing, please. Thank you. This is a serious topic and it's swept across our country and um, it's, it's not something I think anyone takes lightly. Um, first, I wanna address you know, some of the issues that I hear people saying aren't really the same issues that we experience in a small town. And I think we need to make that distinction. We have a small town compared to large municipalities like the NYPD, Chicago PD, LAPD, um, where their budget is in the billions and our budget is a lot less than that. And so while some of those criticisms may be true, um, it might not apply to our city. We, we really don't have over-policing in our city. I'm, I'm looking at our call logs and our, our, our calls for service, sometimes we're two, maybe three calls um, in the queue behind. So um, I think uh, any, any, kind of, any, any kind of action is going to need to to push towards funding our police, whether that be in training, whether it be in more programming. Um, I, I would love to have more of our officers be bilingual, especially for our Middle Eastern population. Um, I know education is a huge thing on that. I was part of the leadership program through the East County Chamber of Commerce leadership program. And we were working on a program to get basic um, how, teaching uh, newcomers what 911 is meant for. Um, so uh, our, our officers and our fire department, our paramedics are available for them. Um, so the second thing is, I think we have, I think our leadership in El Cajon right now has a, a focus on community policing Mike Murphy was, is our sergeant and actually the president of our Police Officers Association Union. And he was in the news recently about um, two young kids um, graffiti, doing graffiti on a wall that wasn't theirs. And he rolled and caught them. And instead of handing them a ticket, he sat and he talked to them. And um, he listened to what they were saying. They wanted to get their views out. So yeah. he said, made a deal with them saying, um, if you come back with me tomorrow and help me clean up the graffiti and paint over it, I will find you a place to paint and get your message out. So now we have this beautiful mural um, uh, making its way around El Cajon. Um, this was right after the um, one of the shootings that happened. Um, and those is, that's just one example of how our leadership is impressing upon our younger officers and on the city on, on how to handle um, situations where maybe a ticket isn't really needed. Maybe just uh, their voice needs to be heard. So um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's serious. I think training's needed. Um, and uh, I, I would agree with, I say, both of my, my um, opponents here that, that programs are needed and, and getting out into the communities to establish trust is important. Thank you very much. Let's do a quick one minute question here, but because these are district elections and the whole point of going to districts is so that the needs of each individual part of the city can be represented by that 
whoever the winner is. So I would like to ask each of you how long you've lived in District 4 and do you have any specific priorities for your section of the city? Uh, let's see, I'm sorry, this would be uh, Dunya, you're first. Um, I've been in this uh, district for, I say, 15 to 17 years. And then I lived on the other side of, um, I think, District 2 um, mm -hmm. for the remaining of the year here. So I've been here 30 years, 30 plus years. Um, my main concern is our main street and Wallison, <laughs> where I live. Um, it became a very high crime rate here on Mollison and Main Street. We have a lot of homelessness. Uh, so these are my two main streets that I'm targeting. Very good, thank you. Um, Phil, what would you do specifically for District 4? Yes, yeah, so when I'm talking to my neighbors and myself, I'm on Washington and I know street racing is always a topic, oh. even on the yeah. ancillary streets, not, mm -hmm. not even Chase, Chase, Washington, Avocado coming down. Street racing is an issue. Even the people on the ancillary streets, it's a big problem. There was even a, one of my friends um, had, who was a teacher in the school district had a car go into her, uh, into her, brother's, uh, into her brother's car and he was in the hospital. Mm. Wow. Um, so we designated funding um, to do uh, patrols for street racing. And a lot of these people who are street racing, they don't live in the city. They don't live in the district. They don't live... Um, anywhere near here. They come in here, it's straight away. Um, so it affects, it wakes up my daughter when, we're, when she's taking naps. So uh, that's one thing that I hear and that I experience frequently is street racing. Homelessness obviously um, is, is a big issue that we need to continue to, to address. Um, but the one that's not heard a lot, but that I hear frequently when I'm talking to my neighbors is street racing is a big problem. Yeah, so I'd like I to hear continue. a lot about that too. Yeah. Oh, and briefly, how long have you lived in the district, Phil? Oh, sorry, about three years. Okay, great. Estella, how about you? Your priorities been, for District 4, sorry. Yes, and I've been living in the district for 40 years, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, and constantly, I'm going to say it again, uh, homelessness. And for years, I've been advocating um, models around the country that have worked. Some in New York, Safe Haven, and Eugene, Oregon. And finally, finally, three weeks ago, the city council approved some tiny houses tiny homes as they call it, um, which is at Meridian Baptist, Meridian Church. And, and this was a, a model that is successful. And I would implement also an outreach team that would go out for assessing um, and, and fund this you know, through the city. Uh, because many of our homeless populations, they have mental issues and they have substance abuse issues. I see this all over and, um, in my district, on Maine and everywhere that um, you drive around in, in our fourth district. Yeah. And even when I come to work, uh, I think they need a holistic approach, which means addressing food, shelter, uh, medical resources, and a training program to prepare them for independence, uh, to be independent. I participated in the, in the East County uh, Homeless Task Force, which everyone knows there's a regional one, but I think there's a lot of resources, a lot of organizations that are concerned that we can build a model in order to serve our, our homeless population and create more of a cleaner environment because it does affect the cleanliness of our city. I've heard this over and over um, just by looking at our streets and seeing them full of homelessness. Um, you know, that, that doesn't look good. It reflects on our city and our city needs and what we're avoiding and we're ignoring it. Uh, we just can't sweep it under the rug and pretend the homelessness is just going to go away because they're, they're here and we need to address it. And, and again, you know, I I know this is an issue that we've talked about, but it's in my district and I want to see it, you know, I want to see some remedies. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. You, you kind of jumped in and answered my next question, which is about homelessness, but I'm going to actually combine two, two questions here, I think. So Estella will have a little more to talk about maybe. Homelessness, of course, is a very major issue in El Cajon. And to the city's credit, they have spent more money than other East County cities to try to address the problem. And yet they still have the highest number of homeless people of the cities in East County. So I would like to ask each of you, if you haven't already addressed it, your approach to get help for the homeless while also protecting the residents and businesses from issues caused by homelessness. And in addition, I'm going to throw in that the city currently funds you know, short-term 30-day housing or so for the homeless at the East County Transitional Living Center, which, which does a great job for what it is, but to get the long-term 
privately funded help over there, like job training, uh, that's really only open on a faith-based you know, basis for people of the Christian faith. So I also wanted to ask when you address your homelessness approach, do you think the city should try to establish an independent long-term program similar to that, but that is not faith-based and is open to, to everybody in the city, whether you're of any faith or no faith at all, I guess. And um, let's see, Phil, it's your turn to go first on this one. Great, yeah, so, uh so there's two questions. Do we have four hours to answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a good two minutes anyway. On the, on no, the, on I, this, I, it, this is a complicated yeah, issue and it's it the thing that I think about the most. I mean, like I said, I have homeless people that have slept on my doorstep that I haven't been able to get out of my home. Um, so it's, it's impacting me it's directly. Um, it's personal. And, and uh, I think the model that we need to continue to adopt is to partner with nonprofit organizations that have been in the have the experience of solving homelessness for decades, instead of the city creating its own department um, and trying to figure out how to solve homelessness. I think any time that we partner with a nonprofit, they're going to be able to utilize the funding a lot more effectively. They're going to be able to harness the power of of uh, volunteers, which the city can't do. So I think that's the model that we need to continue to go after. And the tiny house pro program that we partnered recently with Meridian Baptist, that was um, sponsored by myself and Councilman Steve Goble. Um, and so I know that there's been criticism with the city and they're not doing enough. I mean, I'm doing my best to try anything. And if an uh, organization wants to come into, you know, any part of East County and, and use their resources and time, talent, and treasure to come in and, and solve homelessness and help people overcome their um, mental poverty, their, their addiction. Um, I, I'm all for it. You know, like we, there's plenty of, of, of homeless people out there to help. Um, come on in. We're more than happy to. I, I do. I am a little worried that, um, other cities aren't, aren't helping, um, as much as we are. The city spent over $640,000 on homeless programs, um, to give into nonprofit organizations. Um, and I, I do have a concern about our citizens where we, we may be becoming a magnet because we have so many services here. So we need to keep an eye on that. And that's not to say we should stop, but we just need to keep an eye on that. Um, I mean, all that to say, um, I, I think that um, the county and the state need to also help as well. We've done a great job. We, we did the Way Back Home program with Salvation Army. Um, getting ho uh, housing for 86 individuals at a cost less than $240 per person. So we have this population that we were helping. The next population that we need to address have the severe drug addiction and mental health issues. And that's going to cost a lot of money. And small budget cities can't address this on their own. Um, the state had mental health facilities in the 80s, the 60s and 70s. They were taken out in the 80s. Look at one to two generations later, we have hundreds of people on our streets with severe mental health issues. So um, we, we, we need to partner and petition to, our, to the county and to the state and to other cities to, to help us out. I think El Cajon is doing a good job. Um, we've spent the most out of any city in San Diego other than the city of San Diego. Um, is, am I out of time? I think, I think we are. Okay. John, are we at time? Okay, thank you. Um, Estella, yes. um, you've talked a little bit, but go ahead and let's hear some more from you on the issue of homelessness. Um, as I said before about the model, and uh, first of all, I believe it's our city's responsibility. We have enough taxes. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that looking at the budget, we can allocate to make that a priority. I, I do know about CDBG because I've been receiving those funds. Right now, there's Secure Acts fun funding for emergency, emergency funds for, due to COVID. Um, there's some funds there. And one thing I want to bring up, you mentioned the transitional living. Um, I know that some of them have requirements, but I believe that should not be a requirement. I believe homelessness should be addressed regardless um, you know, of requirements. If you're homeless and you have some needs, mental or whatever that is, um, you should be assisted. Um, I believe that there's a lot of blighted areas. Um, I wanna touch on that. A lot of empty lots, a lot of, uh, in fact, there's one here in the, in the corner uh, of my home and around the corner from my work where homeless just, they live there and they reside there and the owners do not take responsibility. One particular building, and I can go on and on, um, they just 
don't care. And that we, re, you know, I've been told that they've been uh, reported to the city and the city turns a blind eye and says, you know, we've already contacted the owner, but owners need to be accountable for those blighted areas. Um, they need to be sent a letter and be fined if they don't, you know, either knock the building down and build a new one or um, make use of that building because it's a, it's a good hub for our homelessness to um, be there and create more of an uncleanliness city. And I believe that if those blighted areas were addressed, they could become, you know, a development for housing. So I think it's our responsibility as citizens. Uh, I do believe we pay a lot of taxes. Um, I remember there at one point we were the highest tax city um, and there are funds to address the homelessness. Other cities have done it. Why can't we do it? Okay, thank you. Dunya, what is your approach to homelessness? If uh, my opponent Phil wants four hours, we need months for this to target this issue. I know. <laughs> this issue of homelessness is not just homelessness. It's the crime related to the homelessness. It's the drug issue, the drug addiction. It's the increase of housing rent rental. Um, there's a lot of issues that are related to this homelessness. Um, one of the things that I did is I've not been doing for many um times is I take my granddaughter and we go to homelessness, to homeless on the street. And we, I sit with them and I talk to them and I help them. Um, some of them, I ask them, I have approached them. Why are you homeless? Um, I had a lady who said that, you know, it's during COVID-19 that there is shelter available. However, we get scared. We don't want to get affected by Corona. I had other individual who complained about the hours, how they treat them at the shelter saying that there's, um, there's curfew time and that they cannot do uh, you know, they cannot leave after curfew and they have to be there certain hours. So all these needs to be reassessed. Um, there's from me working with my background, working as an advocate in the past, there's a lot of programs that United States offers. Um, they have more opportunity here than they have in, in Middle East or in any, any other countries. So we have a lot of programs. We have budget dedicated for that program. But my priority is, is to make sure that these are being assessed correctly. Um, the procedures of the shelters and, you know, like holding them for 30 days and there is no long term. What are they going to do after that? Where are they going to go? Salvation mm -hmm. Army, where they host people who leave uh, jails, you know, they host them for a certain period of time for rehabilitation. And then after that, there's no long term. There's no job uh, qualification for them. Uh, a lot of them have criminal records. They have a felony. They can't get a job. So they ended up on the street. Um, I had a lady who she lives in an apartment and she said she was going to go homeless next month because of the increase of the rent. Um, another thing that I really want to target is making sure that we need to reassess who's taken Section 8, who's taken HUD programs, who's, qualifi who's qualifying for these. There's a lot of people who are overqualified that are continue on getting these help. There's people that I know personally that they make a lot of money yet they don't report that money they're still on Section 8. They're still taking low-income apartments. They hold on to it until they save their money to buy houses. So we need to reassess that. That's Thank one you. thing that is very important. We need to reassess. And another thing is maybe utilize other cities' budget because they don't have so much homeless issue. We're, we're at assess time, Dunya. So if I want to remind everybody to watch over there. And, and uh, our timekeeper, John, will... We'll, let you know when you're getting close or when you're at time and we'll let you finish the sentence, but we want to try to get as much in as we can, but you will have closing statements or if you use less time on a future question, you can, you know, use that to expound on, expand on, uh, you know, something earlier. Let's move on and talk about some business issues. The pandemic has taken a big toll on the economy locally and really across the country. I would like to know what each of you would do to try to attract more business and commerce to bring jobs and revenue to, um, to Alcajon. Um, let's see, uh, Estella, you're first on this one. Okay, and you're absolutely right. COVID-19 has turned the world upside down and it has affected every household in America, mm -hmm. let alone residents have been traumatized, businesses have been shut down and it's, and it's impacted everyone. And I believe that, you know, first of all, as a city, we should follow precautions on CDC guidelines. It's a humane issue and it's a health issue, besides being an economic issue as well. Um, we, I know that the city has placed into order Secures Act funding to help uh, the renters program. I, I think that in this, with the same uh, funds, we can have, we can help some of those businesses because those businesses are surviving right now. And um, I know that it's important to keep those businesses open. So I 
I would um, fund some businesses to stay open, um, get some remedies um, to uh, keep them, uh, have the doors open because we don't know when this pandemic is going to go away. Um, you know, I don't think anyone yeah. knows. I, I just want to jump in and say, I did have a question later about, okay. you know, wh how we should use CARES fund, fund, act funds, but this specific question was about any ideas for attracting new revenues for the, for the city beyond helping the existing businesses that, that we have. So sorry, I should have clarified that up front. <laughs> okay. Well, I believe there is new revenues. Uh, we just have to um, look at the budget, allocate uh, where the needs are. And uh, right now, you're right, uh, the needs are in the businesses. And I support commerce. And I would like to see the city have more economic growth. So I would support um, bailing out some of these businesses so that they can stay open. All right. Thank you very, very much. Uh, let's see. Ross track here. Uh, Don, Dunya, you're next. Um, one of the things that I really would like to see is assessing the unemployment uh, benefits for those small business owners. Um, a lot of them, even though that they're, um, they're allowed to open their businesses and resume their work, they decide to close down and then they collect the unemployment. So we need to reassess on that. Um, we need to re-promote and allocate budget for independent individual who finish education and then utilize their, their degree toward investing something into the city. Okay, thank you. Phil, your ideas for um, attracting new revenues to Al Cajon or helping businesses, I guess we'll make it kind of general here. <laughs> yeah, so, jumping in on that. yeah, no, no worries. So um, to, to bring in new revenues, the first thing you have to do is listen to businesses and listen to developers and listen to people who want to open businesses and ask them, what's stopping you from opening up in El Cajon? And then from there, we move forward with, do we need to change regulations? Do we need to, um, you know, alter this policy or just make it easier at City Hall? Uh, we've been doing that at City Hall for uh, as long as I've been there, which isn't that long, a year and a half, but I know they've been doing it there for a long time. We have the lowest impact fees, developer fees mm -hmm. in the county to make it easy for uh, people to build those uh, commercial developments and um, uh, mixed use where it's commercial space on the bottom and then apartments up top. Um, we, uh, we're, El Cajon has been designated by Governor Newsom as an opportunity zone. And so there's huge tax breaks for businesses to come in and develop land. Um, that, that's a massive opportunity. We're one of two areas in San Diego. Um, so I'll answer the CARES funding later, but that's, that's the, how we do it. Very good, thank you so much. Moving on, um, Parkway Plaza, our regional shopping mall in El Cajon recently sold to a new owner who has announced that they want to eliminate the regional shopping mall to build housing and office space, but that would require the approval of the city council. I know I talked to at least one council member who had some real concerns about that and wasn't so sure the council would do it. Do you believe it should be kept as a shopping mall? or torn down and replaced with housing or offices, or that some compromise should be forged, that, that the city should insist that the new owners maybe allow for some housing on a portion of that large property, but require that, you know, maybe add a sec, but like adding a second story or using maybe one piece of the property for that, but insisting that they retain the shopping mall for the convenience of the residences and frankly, the sales tax that that brings into the city. Um, Dunya, I believe it's your turn to go. Did I did I get that mixed up? I think it's Dunya's turn to go first. Go ahead. I, I smiled because when I grew up here, I worked as a security in Parkway Plaza for Westfield oh. Shopping. So that was um, part of my job working here at the, at the mall while I was in school. <laughs> um, Parkway Plaza is 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 a very very nice uh, shopping mall, and um, mm -hmm. a lot of people in the community here, they like to go shopping. You know, this is one way of venting out, especially right now, what we have with COVID, there's so much uh, limited in the activities. So people, my son is one of them. Every time he's bored, he goes to the shopping mall, you know, when they open up, if there are certain stores that are open. So I'm totally against tearing it down and building housing. There's a lot of lands. There's a lot of other opportunities that they can do. We only have this mall here in El Cajon City. And this has been going on since I grew up here. And, you know, um, I'm totally against the idea of tearing it down. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Phil, you're next. Thanks. So that's a very complicated issue. Um, I think you have to 
listen and watch and evaluate um, what is happening at Parkway Plaza. If it's a, if it turns out in a year, two years, five years, that it's a ghost town and businesses aren't moving into those spots in the mall, um, then that's not helping anybody. It's not providing a service for our residents. It's not providing sales tax for the city so we can turn those uh, turn that into services for our citizens. So um, we need to eval stop and evaluate um, and, and determine uh, based off of evidence, what's the best use, use for that property. Um, I'm not totally opposed to having it be mixed use and having apartments above um, the, uh, having apartments above the mall. My wife goes there. She takes my son there all the time. It's the last owner did a great job after Westfield left it. Um, you know, there was leaks in the, in the, uh, leaks in the roof. So they did a great job. So, um, there's a lot of land there. I think we need to keep watching it and determine what needs, what needs to be done based off of the evidence of it. Okay. Estella, your thoughts on the future of Parkway Plaza? I do not want to see Parkway Plaza, um, torn down. It's ironic that we just spoke about businesses. We just spoke about economic growth. So, where do you balance that? I mean, we're going to tear down all these businesses. Does it make sense? These are businesses that are, are successful, have been successful. And I believe that um, it is a landmark of El Cajon. You know, everyone mentioned their, their, their children go, you know, there, I think there used to be a merry-go-round. I'm not sure if it's still there. I remember taking my children to the merry-go-round. Um, it's gone, it was, unfortunately. You know, my kids loved it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's good for the city. Um, it's good for the morale. It, it brings revenue to the city. Um, it's economic growth. You know, there is plenty of room for affordable housing in other uh, places in El Cajon. I just mentioned all the blighted areas we have. I welcome developers. Make some more affordable housing. That's one of my priorities as well. But don't knock something down. If, if, it's, if it's working, why knock it down? Why, uh, you know, tear down some economic growth that we, we already have? We already have businesses there. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I would throw in on that, that it seems to me that the current, I would say that the, the immediate past owner during the pandemic, just as a point of information, wasn't really doing anything to promote the businesses that were there. We actually reached out to them and asked them, said, we want to do a story about what's still open at the mall and what's not, um, because people were confused. And their answer was to send us a list of all the tenants and say we should contact each one individually. I mean... I think they could have done better. So my first personal two cents worth is that, you know, maybe before they tear it down, you know, a little more could be done in a post-pandemic. They, they collect rent on time. They collect rent on time and they impose punishments and late fees. I'm sure they know who's open and who's not. <laughs> yeah, I would have thought so. Moving on to housing, which each of you has touched on a little bit, but California and the county face a shortage of housing especially affordable housing. Sandag and the state have mandates now for, for cities on this. What steps specifically do you support to increase housing availability, especially affordable housing, while you know, protecting the character of communities and um, you know, other things that, that are important? And uh, Phil, it's your turn to go first on this one. Great, thank you. No problem. So um, with regard to housing, there was a study that was done in 2016 for the San Diego area by Point Loma uh, University. And it attributed 40% of the cost of housing is attributed to regulations. Um, so I'm not saying we need to roll back everything right away, but if we want to look at the incremental cost of, of uh, housing and why it's so expensive, um, it, we have to look at regulation and that's what something we've done in El Cajon is we've gone to the developers, people building homes and saying, how can we make it more efficient for you to build? Um, what can we get through um, the pipeline faster because time is money for them. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is um, we've, we've done as much as we can in the city. There's not a lot of land left in the city to develop. Um, there's, a, there's a big spot over by uh, the trolley, the MTS station, there's a huge parking lot. We're working with MTS to get to secure that for um, apartments, low income apartments. It's right next to transit, it's convenient for people. Um, and it's, it's a lot of underutilized space in the city. We just finished the project for homeless, for veterans, low income veterans, um, right in city center, right off of Main Street. Um, so I think we're doing a good job. Um, it's really difficult to hit arena numbers that the county and the state put on us just because of the lack of, 
of, uh, of real land that's in, in, in the city. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Estella, your thoughts on housing. And thank you because every day we receive calls, overwhelming calls about the exorbitant rents. And these are calls coming from low to moderate income populations, as I mentioned earlier. We have a lot of seniors here, a lot of mobile home parks here, a lot of veterans here. Um, we have uh, a tremendous need for more units. I believe other cities have more affordable housing complexes than we do. And this has been an issue and a concern of mine for many years. So I believe it would increase revenue, as we mentioned a little while ago, the economic growth. And it helps some of our homeless because a lot of these transitional housing are uh, short-term shelters. We don't have any shelters. Um, I think you know, we don't have an abundance of them. And we can, um, you know, developers are always uh, seeking um, building locations to build. I remember when we had the condominium units um, going up a couple of years ago, um, there was overwhelming support for that. And I think that affordable housing is something that needs to be done, especially because of the rents are so high and we don't have rent control. Uh, we need rent stabil st stabilization. And I believe affordable housing would be close to it. Thank you. Dunya, your views on housing and affordability. Um, I totally uh, would, first of all, regulate new laws that between tenants and landlord, there's a lot of um, discrimination between the two and there's a lot of um, landlords take advantage of certain things that they have. Um, so that's one thing. Second of all, decrease the housing uh, rental here through, you know, through programs, needs, and other, and other priorities. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is um, plan and assess new people who are getting the low income, the HUD programs, the Section 8. There's a lot of people who leaves the city, leave the state actually, goes to another state, uh, so they don't want to be put on 15 years, 16 years waiting list for Section 8. Grab the Section 8 from a different state and then come back here after a year. And that's an issue. That's an issue that we face and we need to assess that. We, we want to make sure that the people here who have children, who are single parents, who are senior, they have more priorities than other people who have been here for, you know, for a couple of years who goes to a different state and come back with a Section 8. Um, mm -hmm. I totally with that, that we need to do a new laws with the landlords, you know, because a lot of landlords also take advantage, especially now during COVID-19. I know that uh, President Trump had mentioned, you know, don't take rent. There's no eviction notices. A lot of them violated that. A lot of them, um, they just, they closed businesses down just because they didn't, they couldn't afford to pay the rent. Um, so we need to impose more laws on this. And that's okay. my, my priority. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here from readers. We had some people who were concerned about landlords in El Cajon that they say have been forcing new tenants to bear high costs of treatments for things like bed bugs, roaches, and mold that come back after the landlord has like treated this when they put it on, on the market. And then, you know, suddenly the problem comes back a month after the tenants move in without addressing underlying problems like maybe water leaks that might be causing that mold. So I had two related questions on this. I'll throw them both in here. Would you support any kind of law to require landlords to guarantee, say, six months of habitable living conditions and bear the cost of remediation if a problem they treated, you know, before it went on the market or, or, or up for rent comes back? And do you support hiring more code enforcement officers to address these kinds of problems? Or do you have other ideas for how this issue should be addressed? And um, let's see, I think... Uh, Stella, it's your turn to lead off. Thank you. Um, that's a very good um, question, concern, issue, um, the way you formatted it. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Hope it wasn't too complicated. But. Yeah. There's a lot of inhabitability issues. I cannot begin to, to even um, go on about the mold and the uh, bed bugs and uh, everything that we talked about. We had homes that were rain, had holes in the roofs and it was raining and they'd get their house flooded. That's how bad it is. Um, we only have two court enforcement officers. Uh, we had one um, probably until about three years ago. Um, and for the population of our city, we need to hire more court enforcement uh, because it is an issue. These are old buildings, old apartments. We get calls all the time. Uh, landlords, you know, they want, they would like assistance with this, but if there's no court enforcement, officers to go out there and assess and see what they need, um, then, you know, we can't, we can't assist those households. 
uh, tenants have to bear the cost. That's not, that's not appropriate. That's not fair uh, because a lot of them are low income. Um, I believe there would, there should be an ordinance to make, to hold landlords accountable, at least for the first six months. And then after that, um, you know, would be the tenant's responsibility uh, because it's, it's an open communication. It's, it's, you know, their shelter. And I believe that um, it should be addressed because it's a, it's a health issue as well as a um, housing issue. Okay, thank you, Estella. Uh, let's see here. Um, Dunya, what are your views on this issue? Of um... Um, I totally agree with my opponent. And just to add on, there's a lot of cockroaches issues as well. The, the city of El Cajon have um, older buildings. You know, they built um, in the 1950s and the 1960s. So there's a lot of landlord that refuses to remodel. A lot of uh, landlord, they refuse to treat cockroaches. Um, I personally, I have family members who complained and complained to housing authorities and the housing authority, they take the complaint and a year, two years later, they respond with, you know, uh, let's take them to civil suit or you can do this and you can do that in a, in a, in a legal matter, but nothing's been resolved. Um, they come, I know that one issue, that one issue, we had a lot of cockroaches where they infested the whole apartment they were inside the walls and a uh, housing authority sent a representative. He just looked at it, filled the report um, the tenant weren't even allowed to, to obtain a copy of that report. They didn't even know what's their next procedures. So there is a lack of procedure uh, and guidance with this. And I totally believe that we need to promote uh, future planning, future assessment of what we're going to do. And um, they need all to work hand in hand. There's a lot of programs, like I said, um, the housing authority should step up and do a little bit more work. That's what I believe. Thank you, Dunya. And Phil, uh, what are your views about how to address this um, habitability issue? Yeah, so quick story. When I was in college, I rented half of a garage for five fifty dollars a month um, as, as housing. So I know what it's like to have habitability issues. Um, the city has an apartment inspection program where we're cracking down on slumlords um, for safety issues. I mean, some of the reports I've seen from our inspectors and we do have more we have we have a handful of inspectors um i don't know how many we have but it's more than one but um this is no hot water running um holes through walls where rodents can get through and so we're cracking down electrical issues we're cracking down on it we also have a hotel motel program where um where we're enforcing basic um habitability standards um so we're taking it seriously. Um, secondly, landlords have to be responsible for their own property. That's that's a full stop there. If the tenant did damages to it, then they have to pay for that. But if you have mites and bugs and all this, then that's completely on the property owner to, to maintain their property in a livable standard. Um, and then also, there, um, I'm going to work on having anonymous reporting. Um, so if a tenant has a bad living environment, you can anonymously report it to the city and the city can send our, one of our code enforcement people out and do an inspection. Um, we, we contract with Estella, um, CSA for, at, for housing rights um, with her program, CSA, and they do a phenomenal job. That's another example of how nonprofits can do more than the city. Um, but uh, all that to say, we, I, I've been one of those tenants that want to report um, but uh, you're afraid of reprisal. You're afraid, you're afraid of um, uh, uh, someone coming back at you. And so um, the anonymous reporting, I think, is a, a fantastic idea that I'm working with the city manager on right now. Very good. Thanks to all of you for addressing that. I think the next question we can probably wrap up in a minute here. But uh, the city, you know, I, I think did a, a great thing in getting, after 10 years, the East County Performing Arts Center reopened as the Magnolia Center under the management of Live Nation, the biggest concert promoter in the world. And unfortunately, the pandemic hit, you know, not long after they reopened, and we don't know when they're going to be able to go back to doing concerts. So the question is, will each of you commit to continue civic support of the Magnolia uh, whenever live shows are allowed to resume and to work with Live Nation to make sure we don't lose this community resource. Um, it's your turn to go first. I want you mentioned Magnolia. I remember the old days when they used to do every year the cultural uh, diversity of the food and uh, the way they dress up and they come down and I was part of that as well. Um, I'm totally with keeping the Civic Center because I think that that's what holds our city. That's that's the um, 
I will call it the pole of our city because uh, a lot of youth individuals as well as older individuals who are from different diversity, different cultural background, they like to go there and, and this is what gets them excited. So I, I, I'm totally with keeping it and not only keeping it, but also uh, putting more creative uh, ideas and, and, and invest in more um, on this. Very good. Thank you, Dunya. Um, <coughs> sorry. Phil, uh, let's hear from you on the future of the Magnolia or the Performing Arts Center. The Magnolia is a fantastic asset for the city and a resource. Um, I used to watch my brother perform there when he was in high school, when it was called ECPAC. Mm -hmm. And um, I have fond memories of being there. Um, yes, we need to continue to make sure that the Magnolia is the staple of our downtown area. When I, I have a bachelor's in criminal justice and a master's in public administration. Whenever you're revitalizing a downtown area, you need what's called an anchor some staple that's going to draw people there and the magnolia is our anchor for the downtown area and it's going to allow other businesses to thrive it's going to allow other business other development uh restaurants and things like that to open up you look at an example like in la mesa um 10 years ago it was antique row it was sleepy and it had a chance of dying but the city made a concerted effort to make walkability parking easier that's exactly what we've done with downtown el cajon and even an enhancement with the Magnolia. So um, it's when you increase patronage, when you increase walkability, when you increase people buying things, it cuts down on crime passively. Mm -hmm. It cuts down on homeless encampments. This is public administration 101. And so um, it's a great okay. resource. It was bringing revenue in within four months. I mean, and we were projecting for it to uh, be at a loss for a year. So great. the great. needs there, are we out of time or no? Yeah, go ahead. You can finish the sentence. Okay. We're at time. <laughs> um, it was, it was, it was projecting revenue after a year, we got it in four months. And so the needs there, the desires there, it's a great partner with Live Nation. We got two hotels coming in where people can stay. Um, so I, I think it's a great resource. Thank you. And Estella, uh, let's hear from you about the future of the Performing Arts Center. Absolutely, it is fine arts. Um, it's a landmark for me that I've been here so many years. My daughter used to dance there, perform there. Uh, with CYT. Uh, we had, you know, there was a lot of venues there um, and the venues were great before the pandemic started. I think, you know, we're a di very diverse city and it brings very diverse entertainment. Um, thank you, Dunya, for reminding me of the International Festival. That was so much fun. Uh, we had all kinds of cultural um, entertainment and everyone just had a great time. And I think this kind of replaces that um, because we don't have that anymore. But I definitely, definitely think it brings revenue. Uh, it brings, you know, family fun. Um, and it encourages our fine arts because we, we have to respect our fine arts um, here in, in, in our city and our, all of our talents that we have. That's great to hear. I, I think we all have that in common, a love for the Performing Arts Center. I certainly remember my own daughter when she was a little girl. Uh, they put ice on the on the stage one year tech ice and she got to go out there and do do jumps on the ice which was you know a highlight for everybody um moving on let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic a bit I've got a couple quick questions I think most of these we can probably do in a minute but El Cajon previously allocated CARES Act funding to help businesses and renters if there's any more federal CARES Act funding or similar named relief funds coming available what would your top priorities be for those funds? Uh, Phil, I think you're first on this one. Perfect, yeah, so we allocated in the first round of funding almost a million dollars for uh, rental relief, uh, utility assistance, um, and food for seniors, emergency food for seniors. I spoke to um, Persimmon Apartments manager and the managers of the senior apartment complex were getting, pulling their money together to get cans, of, one or two cans of food um, for their seniors per day. Um, and I'm, I get emotional thinking about how it, bad it's affected it. So we need to continue reaching out to our community partners to see what the need is, reach out to our other cities to see if they're doing anything that we're not doing. Um, and then also we spent about $2 million in um, CARES Act for business grants so they can rehire employees um, so they can save their businesses from shuttering. So all that to say, those are the priorities right there that I've said, continue doing them and look for other opportunities if they're out there. Very good. Estella, your views on that? Uh, yes, I believe I mentioned that earlier when I went on a yeah. 
on a rampage of, um, uh, I believe, you know, economically, everyone, everyone needs um, some funding. And yes, the Secures Act has, has bailed a lot of our cities out. Uh, we do need more funding. I know that a lot of cities have uh, spent them on different, different programs. I've read a lot, you know, since we have received the rental assistance program, it's helped a lot of people, but there's more need, more need than there is funds. Yeah. Um, we get overwhelming uh, calls in regards to that. But I also think that um, we should have some programs to assist the homelessness again. Um, I know that City of La Mesa did that with the Secures Act. I know that other cities are, can do that. So I believe that I would assess that and help them as well. Food is important um, because, you know, our seniors, our low income, social security, fixed income yeah. um, populations, you know, this is all they, sometimes they have a good meal. That's, that's their meal for the day. Um, I encourage that. And, and also encourage to also, um, you know, create some funding for these businesses to stay open again, because I believe in commerce and I believe that, uh, you know, we all, we're all in this together. We have to, um, have our city survive and the Secures Act, this is exactly what it's for. Okay, thank you. Dunya, how would you spend any additional CARES Act funding if it becomes available? Um, I mentioned before that I grew up in a war zone. I grew up in Iraq where we had to, um, our priority was food and shelter. So I'm totally toward uh, providing food, not only for seniors, but for those who are on low income, um, those who have children that are, you know, um, that they face a small amount of, of assistance from the welfare department and food stamp and so forth, um, providing food, not only for them, but also for um, the people who are need, needing those food. You know, we have like the homeless people, they, they don't get a lot of, they get a general relief, they get um, a small percentage of, of general relief, that not even enough to, for them to rent a room. Um, like my opponent Phil said, back in the days he rented a garage for 550. Now you can rent a spot in a room for 500. You can share a room with, with three or four individuals for 500. Um, so these homeless or the uh, females on the street, there's a lot of females that have been living in the street. Um, we need to target those and we need to make sure that these are um, taken care of along with their kids. Um, I'm also targeting toward cleanless. We need to clean the city. There is a lot of um, Today, I, I was driving by Mollison and there was a lot of trash in, on the streets. I know um, I talked to the um, city hall about a month ago and they did, a, they did a campaign a month ago or they did some kind of uh, work where they went on the street and cleaned all the streets. But now if you drive down Mollison and Maine, you see trash everywhere. Um, so I want to locate as well uh, for a program for that to make the city clean, make it beautiful, make it like the way it used to be. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody honoring, you know, the time limit so we can get as many of these questions as we've just got a couple more here. Um, let's see. Well, I've got a couple more on COVID. Um, a couple of readers wanted to know, the mayor has indicated, he's of course concerned about, you know, the mental health aspects and the economic acts, aspects of all the shutdowns. But he actually has said that he doesn't think that the police should have to enforce the COVID-19 mandates on businesses for closures and so forth, or for wearing masks. So can each of you briefly share your views on should those laws be enforced or shouldn't they? Um, I've lost track here. Let's tell you first. Um, that sounds familiar. <laughs> I've heard that on a national level, and that's why we're in the predicament we're in. I believe that we should go by strict CDC guidelines. I also believe there's data systems that we can um, implement on a government level, hospital schools to monitor and control this pandemic, not just on a county level, but in our city. I believe we should wear masks. Um, that's going to protect us. And also sanitizing uh, stations. I know that I've seen maybe one, but I would like to see more of those around the city. So I'm all about data and science. I'm all about the mask. I'm all about cleaning and sanitizing. Um, I believe the more that we do that, I'm tired. I'm tired of waiting. We've already been into this 11 months, going on, excuse me, eight months now. I mean, yeah. the, the holidays are coming. And I believe, you know, I, I want to celebrate. I want to go out. But unfortunately, because we're not responsible. You know, I'm protecting you by wearing a mask. It's not about me, but it's protecting others. So I firmly believe we need to take the CDC guidelines uh, seriously because this is a health issue, 
a humane issue. It's not a political issue. It's about our health and it's about our lives. Thank you. Dunya, what are your views on uh, whether the I, laws I, and the masks? I totally hate wearing a mask because I have bronchitis and I have a hard time breathing. But mm -hmm. I do believe we should follow the procedures of the health guidelines. Um, I believe that uh, education and awareness uh, is, is a big deal. Um, not everybody's aware of why we have to wear a mask or why we have to get sanitized, uh, um, you know, at work or anywhere else. I also believe is, is if we can open uh, reservations, Indian reservation for casinos and have a small distance, you know, not the six feet distance, why can't we do it at churches? Why can't we do it at work? So, um, as long as are we, the individual, it's, it's all individual act. And I read something that I really liked. It says, the only cure to solve the coronavirus is you. And if we are not capable of acting the way we should, we should follow the guidelines, the health guidelines, then, then nothing is going to stop us from uh, separating, you know, the, the virus and, and continuing on having that virus. And again, we do want to live a normal life. I don't feel like I'm living a normal life here. And I want to celebrate as well. And, you know, like uh, Stella said, we are, we're tied on certain things. There's a lot of business owners who can open. Uh, and, you know, as long as they follow the guidelines, the health guidelines, then why not open? Why not cut down on the budget of uh, collecting unemployment? You know, there's a lot of issues to this. Thank you. And, and I just want to put in a, a little factual interjection here on the casinos that some people don't realize, but they're on tribal land. And so they actually are considered sovereign nations. They do not have to follow the same laws as everybody else. They have that said, you know, they've made efforts, spent a lot of money on, you know, procedures to try to make it as safe as they can. But uh, we do know there have been some cases and we've actually put in public records act requests trying to get information to find out, you know, are their operations safe? Um, you know, have their sanitation measures worked or just how many cases there are? And we're not real sure, but we do know there have been at least some cases out there. Um, Let's see, I, I didn't mean to jump ahead there. Phil, uh, your thoughts on whether the uh, business closure and masking ordinances should or should not be enforced in El Cajon. Yeah, so I, I think what um, needs to happen is all businesses should be open with the precautions. I mean, closing certain businesses and, and allowing other businesses to stay open, I don't think is fair. And I think there needs to be equal treatment under the law. And um, I was talking to a, uh, I was walking and talking to some of my neighbors and I met a uh, nurse, a registered nurse at Sharp Memorial. And she was talking to me about, you know, she's seen a couple of COVID deaths a week. Um, and she's in the ICU. Yeah. And I asked her, you know, you're, you're seeing it every day. What do you, how do you feel about opening businesses um, along, as long as they have the same precautions as the big box stores? And she said, I think they should be open. You know, she had some comments about restaurants because it poses a different and bars because you're close and you're talking and things like that. Yeah, but, you have to, um, can't have the mask on when you're eating. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think that um, we need to open businesses with precautions, wear a mask. It's, it's a tough, mm -hmm. it's a very tough uh, disease for some people and uh, for other people. One of my friends, he had COVID. He said he had a common cold that was worse. My other friend, he said it was one of the worst things he's ever gone through in his life. So if, you, if you're compromised immune system, you've got to stay at home, make the precautions. I'm out of time, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, my daughter is a physician assistant. And she works in a COVID-19 ward up in, in another county. And I know she's, dealing, she's having to deal with dying people every single day on those respirators. And, and her comment to me was, Mom, if everybody would just wear masks for six weeks, we'd be done with this. Everything could reopen and we wouldn't have a problem anymore. So for what that's worth, coming from an ICU uh, worker, that, that was her point of view. Um, moving on. Um, of course, COVID-19 has negatively impacted the budgets of cities because they have the added cost of addressing things like extra sanitation and so forth, but they also have reduced revenues from sales tax with so many businesses closed or operating at reduced capacity. So what I would like to ask is if you're the winner of the election, what would your budget priorities for the city be? Not necessarily to address COVID things, but just in general, what would your top priority be in this era of limited funds? Um, let's see, Phil, you're first. You broke up there real quick. Is, oh, what I'm are sorry. My, what are my you're... top priorities for the budget? Uh, yes, if yes. Mm -hmm. 
So um, like I think I said in my opening statement, public safety, um, the majority of our funding of the $77 million that the city has on an annual budget is to police and fire, um, making sure we're safe and making sure when you need help, people come. Um, another huge portion of it is, I think it's up to 30 or 40% is our pension um, payments, um, our obligations to our retirees. And that is a massive uh, amount that we have to keep a very close eye on. We have a $40 million reserve that we're planning on padding our payments. The state is requiring us to pay $8 million a year, every year more. So $8 million next year, another $8 million the following year. And so we're going to need that reserve to make sure we don't default. Um, and then we also refinanced our, uh, our, our pension payments, um, bringing it down from, am I out of time? Or is that from the old one? Oh, I didn't, I didn't state how long oh, we were yeah, going to give on this one. Um, but we all, we, we, we refinanced our this in a, from probably seven, a minute, minute. Sorry, from, that's okay. Um, from seven, um, from 7% down to three and a half percent over the course of 20 to 30 years, it's going to save us from 70 million to 133 million over the course of 20 to 30 years. I mean, those are life changing funds. So we need to keep an eye on our payments to, 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 to CalPERS. Um, and um, secondly is, is um is our development we need to make sure that we're getting out of the way of businesses and and helping them um succeed thank you estella what would your number one budget priority be i would like to assess and see what the pension plan uh deficit is because i did read a couple of months ago in april in regards to that alcohol is the number one number one city that has a huge pension plan deficit and right now they're going through trying to uh, borrow a bond so um, that makes me believe that you know something is not balancing um, um, I do want to protect the pensions but there needs to be a reassessment to see what how we got to that place because that is not a good place to be when there is a study done on a state level and we're number one um, so that would be number one um, and again you know reassess because I do believe in law enforcement. I do believe in our, you know, public safety, but I also believe there should be a balance in the needs. Uh, I'd like to know, you know, how much is in that, because I do know that um, law, uh, police officers, I believe they, there was a huge um, increase this, this year as well. So I have a lot of questions um, in regards to those two issues. And again, um, I would assess what the community, community needs because we are serving the community. We're not there to, um, you know, to expend the budget on where we want to spend it. We're there to, to serve and meet the needs of the community and see where, those, where that allocation needs to go to. Thank you. Dunya, what would your top budget priority be? Um, I would seek public safety, crime prevention. Um, I would like to promote education among those who have a felony background, you know, to maybe change a program or create a program where um, we can um, do a rehabilitation for them to be independent and they can open their own business and promote investment into the city. So that's my priority. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, I've got, I think, three questions left, and I think we can probably do them in, in a minute each, but uh, El Cajon has a very high rate of pedestrian deaths. What more can be done to reduce that rate? And of course, many of these are homeless people, sometimes immigrants that may not speak the language or know the traffic laws, but what can be done to, to, to prevent these tragedies? Um, let's see, I, I've lost track on that. Uh, Estella, you're first. Um, very good point. And I believe someone mentioned uh, speed racing because that happens 24 yeah. seven. Um, and you know, I've, I've gone through, through some streets, not in my district, but other districts that have put speed bumps and although I don't like them, um, maybe that would work. Um, but I do believe there needs to be, you know, maybe a slower speed uh, because um, there, are, there is speed racing and that's very dangerous. Um, so we, we can, you know, put an ordinance in place on uh, how fast uh, you're allowed to go, but also enforce it. Make these speed racers accountable um, because there's, I, I can't count how many times, you know, it scares me. You know, it could be uh, a child or, you know, again, you mentioned immigrants that don't know uh, laws and languages, and um, it is a concern of mine. So um, I believe, you know, we should address that. Thank you very much. And um, 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Dunya, your views on how to reduce pedestrian deaths. This is kind of related to the previous question. That's why I want to promote education. There is a lot of, like my opponent said, there's the car racing. A lot of the Chaldean and the Middle Eastern community here, we have a lot of Middle Eastern. Um, I lived abroad, so I know that they don't have no law enforced. Um, they can drive the way they want to drive. This is causing a lot of accidents, a lot of death toll. Um, there's crime rates, the high crime rates of use, utilizing drugs and, and so forth from the, you know, the gangsters that we face, the problems that we have here. Um, We'd like, I'd like to impose something where the DMV should maybe use a, a point system. You know, there's another state, I know in the state of uh, Michigan, um, they use a point system. If you reach certain amount of points, then they suspend your license. Um, a lot of the Middle Eastern as well, they get their license, not just the Middle East, a lot of the foreigners who don't speak the language, they get their driver license um, just without knowing or having the knowledge of what's uh, how, how the driving should be, what's the speed limit and so forth. They just memorize it, they don't understand it and they go and take the test. And I've been through that. I've seen a lot of people where they have their driver license but they don't know what the law is. They don't know how to impose the law. So we need okay. to educate them, we need to make them aware of this. Very good, thank you. And Phil, your thoughts on reducing pedestrian deaths in El Cajon? Yeah, so really quickly, um, South Magnolia, if you're familiar with it going all the way south, we just put that on a road diet where it was two lanes going both ways. We brought it down to one lane each way and allowed parking on the side, a bike lane. That slows people down. It allows for pedestrians. I was, the reason for this, I was talking to a resident. Um, there was a weird turn and three times this resident had a car go into his fence, Ooh. avoiding accidents. So I talked with the city manager. We came up with the plan. The, the, we we um, understood how many people were actually going to that last south section of um, Magnolia, and we put it on a road diet. There's no more people getting into accidents. Um, we also did it on Washington, um, going past uh, Second Second and uh, Hamishaw, going out towards Singing Hills. We put that on a road diet as well. So this is a strategy um, that we can use. Um, to, to make it more walkable. Um, with regard to street racing, you need to have um, time uh, off, hour, off hours enforcement. Street races are coming during um, rush hour. They're going on off hours because it's more open. Um, and then punish them to the full extent of the law. That's what we did last time. We impounded their cars. We pub publicized it on our Twitter and social media accounts. Word spreads, don't come here. Um, so those are just a couple of the um, uh, tactics that can be used to, to address it, which we're already implementing. Thank you very much. I want to ask about hate crimes. Um, in this past week, we've had a couple of very unfortunate incidents in East County. Um, there was vandalism at two churches, a Chaldean and a Syriac church. They were both, I believe, in the unincorporated part of El Cajon, not the city, although, of course, many of the parishioners live in the city with all kinds of hate symbols, you know, white power and, and Black Lives Matter, which made no sense, uh, you know, pentagrams, swastikas, very ugly stuff. And then also the second incident involved actually one of our own, well, one of my own friends, a board member, who is, uh, you know, happens to be gay and black and has had a neighbor, you know, where the dog was harassing his dog, running loose, multiple calls, didn't do any good. And now, then he got the neighbor on tape, on video, uh, you know, making very ugly homophobic slurs every time he steps out in his front yard now. So what more do you think, do you have any ideas for how to A, reduce hate crimes and B, maybe do a little better job of holding those accountable who do these kinds of things? Um, and Dunya, let's hear from you first on that. I'm sorry, you cut out the last part. What were you oh, saying? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, do you have ideas for reducing hate crimes and also holding those accountable, uh, doing a better job of, of trying to protect people from this stuff? Um, I'm one of the victims of the hate crimes. I had to um, escape uh, because I, I was living in America. So um, I faced threat, death threats in the Middle East. So that's why I escaped back in August. Uh, one of the vandalism that you were talking about also, that's our church, that's our Chaldean church that happened in, in Rancho San Diego where mm -hmm. they vandalized it a couple of days ago. Um, hate crimes, it's, it's a major issue that we face, not just 
on a state level, it's, it's on a federal level as well. Um, my concern is the social media. I, I know that the Facebook and there's a lot of, um, they're not taking a proper measurement where they stop this hate crimes. There's a lot of posts that being published. There's a lot of activities that goes on on the social media where it promotes uh, the increase yeah. of crimes. Uh, so that's one. The law enforcement, on the other hand, I had an individual um, who called me for help about a week ago, his brother is mentally crazy. Uh, his brother was threatening to, to kill somebody in the street. Um, his brother had been, you know, he vandalized, he's been in and out of jail, in and out for past several years. Um, I agreed with the brother, okay, we need to submit him for a mental hospital. And he said, okay, but he refuses to go. So we contacted Alcohol Police Department. The police officer shows up. He said, I can't do nothing. I said, well, he's telling me that he's gonna hit a white man and he's gonna beat him up to death. Well, he's an adult. Unless he does the act, then we're not going to do nothing. And if he refuses to go, um, we're not going to take him to the mental hospital. So there should be an assessment on the law enforcement as well, where we need to change some of the policies and the constitutional rights that we have to promote with the society. The society changes all the time, and we need to come up with a plan where we need to take an actual measurement to protect and prevent these crimes. These actual prevent measurements are not being taken. Um, face, Facebook is another, another aspect where you, know, you report that there is a hate crime. They don't take it seriously. Oh, they're not yeah. violating the community standards. That's all you get from them. Hi. And this is John, the producer. We are, we are at time, but I do think that that does warrant a follow-up. Miriam, it's up to you whether you want to ask it because... Yeah. You said that we need to change our constitutional rights and I'm trying to understand our, our viewers might wonder what that is. The changing change the laws of, okay, this is human rights. You know, the, what, the incident that I brought up, the police officer said, I can't take him against his will uh, to mental hospital to get help. I can't take him to the hospital. Okay, well, it's violating his human rights. But what if that person is not in a stable mind? He's, he's, he's 5150, the code that they use. Yeah. What if he's not in a stable mind of, of making the right decision? These Why are difficult. On the street yeah. to commit more crimes? Thank you. Yeah, Thank some, you. Of this, some of this goes to state law and federal. So it's a very thorny, it's a very, very yes. thorny yes. issue. Yes, it's an authority thing. Yeah, it's a power thing. Yes. Um, let's see. I, I lost track. But Estella, why don't you jump in and, and tell us your views on that? Yes. Um, fortunately, I've been part of the anti-crime uh, coalition. I work with law enforcement, FBI, and tomorrow we're having a, a regional hate crime uh, forum. And some of them <laughs> are how hate spreads online awareness and community panel on best practices. So this is an issue that is ongoing because of our systemic racism and our institutionalized racism everywhere, not just here in El Cajon. Um, I have worked with the Southern Poverty Law Center, so we do have some hubs here um, that have hate groups. So this is a serious issue. I, I belong to the Hate Coalition. I also uh, formed a 52 uh, organizations to combat hate. We had a forum here in El Cajon Police Department two years ago that I uh, assisted with. We had the district attorney and some speakers, and we actually had some victims of hate uh, share their, um, so I think education is important. Thank you very much. And Phil, what are your ideas about how to combat hate crimes? So um, I know it might sound hard for some people to believe, but when I was in high school, I was chased out of food for less with my three friends. Um, I lived in, I grew up in Santana, I went to Santana out of the Santee parking lot um, because I had my Letterman jacket on and it said Ortiz. And three of my friends uh, were white and they stood up for me. Um, but these guys were in their 20s. And um, Chris, David, and Sean, uh, they're still some of my best friends. And I think that's what we need to start doing is if you see something happening, you need to stand up for your neighbor and say, this has no place in our community. Kick that down the road. Um, being part of the solution is... Um, squashing it right when it happens. Um, and uh, I, I uh, thank you, Estella, for serving on those committees. I, I don't know, I've I don't know of them, but I would love to get involved with them because um, mm -hmm. I don't, a lot of these, hate, I've been to St. Peter's numerous times and it makes my blood boil, makes me want to create a fund to get a, a, uh, a, a reward out and have these people turn on each other and rat each other out. Um, and turn each other in because uh, I've been dealing with it since I was a kid and my friends have gotten beat up and uh, it's gotten better. It really has since I was in high school um, and grade school. But um, 
it's still out there. So I think it starts in the home, it starts in the community, looking out for your neighbors. Very good. I'd like to hear from each of you what endorsements you have that you're most proud of. Estella, let's hear first from you on this. I have the endorsement of the, the San Diego Democratic Party, which I'm very proud of, and also the Electrical Workers Union, um, and also uh, the pro, uh, I forget the title because they changed the title, Southwest Planned Parenthood. Um, so those are the ones that I'm very proud of. Thank you. Dunya, how about you? I just want to um, mention something that I do also, um, mm -hmm. for the previous question, I also work with FBI hand in hand in promoting um, safety for the hate crimes abroad. So I've been um, working hand in hand, I'm submitting reports and things like that. Um, and for, set, for uh, Phil, St. Peter has been, um, they remodeled it, took them two days to do that because the community st stepped up and they pitched in and helped out. So it's already been remodeled, it's already been taken care of. Um, as me being here since August, I wasn't able to, um, I got a little bit sick and I wasn't able to get a lot of endorsement, but it's, I got an endorsement from our Chaldean organizations, the nonprofit organizations. Um, my commitment was not to do any campaign or not to be sponsored at all. So I'm being endorsed by my job. I'm being endorsed by the commun community that I have, the Chald Chaldean community. And it's enough, I'm proud enough to say that I'm getting a lot of sick signatures and endorsement from the community where I live because I want to meet them hand in hand to make sure that we fulfill their needs. Very good. That's important. And Phil, how about you, the endorsements that you're most proud of? You can go to my website, electphilortiz.com for my endorsements, but the one I'm most proud of is my wife's. Um, <laughs> legitimately, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing, you know, cleaning up trash on the streets, the, the all the stuff that I'm doing without her. Um, she's a superhero. We had our, our daughter five months ago and I'm gone. I'm running my business. I'm campaigning. I'm doing city council and she is a superhero and I would not do this without her support or her, her unwavering support because my family comes first. Um, and so she's just an incredible woman. And uh, yeah, so thanks, Rach. Very good. It's time to move on to closing statements now. We'll give everybody a minute and I'm gonna give you an extra, you know, 15 seconds or so on there to tell us, we've talked about a lot of really serious issues tonight, but I'd like to hear from each of you, what do you think is just the best thing about El Cajon? And um, let's see, Phil, you went first. So I think we're gonna reverse the order here and we'll have Estella lead off with the closing statements and what you like best about El Cajon. First of all, I'm very excited to run for city council district four and I seek uh, your vote to ensure broader representation that we have now. I like what I like about El Cajon is we're very diverse. I embrace all the different languages, cultures that we have um, since I've been here. It's it's the demographic has changed. Um, I speak probably up to 20 words, Arabic words, and I'm very proud of that. I, I like that, um, and I just embrace um, the diversity, and that's what I represent. And I believe that El Cajon is the best place to live, work, raise a family. Um, and I wanna put people first. So I hope that you join me in my efforts. I, I think El Cajon has the opportunity for residents to own their home, raise their families in safe neighborhoods and send their children to the best schools possible. So that's what I envision. And that's my goal for El Cajon. Very good, thank you so much, Estella. Dunya, uh, could we please have your closing statements and what you love most about El Cajon? Um, unlike you, yo estudiar dos años en la Universidad Español. So I studied two years of Spanish here, and I speak Spanish. I speak four languages here. Um, I like the diversity as well. I like one thing that Al Cajon gave me is when we came abroad from Iraq and we lived here, um, it gave us the opportunity of expanding. And it gave us the opportunity of, of learning new things, new culture, new food, new style, meeting people from uh, different cultural background. My granddaughter, she's, she's half Chaldean, she's quarter Chaldean, quarter American, white, and half Hispanic. And, you know, we, we love that diversity. We love the idea that El Cajon is the place where I grew up. You know, I spent every memories of my childhood in El Cajon. And that's my, my thing is, um, I want to make sure that people who lives here, they're living the way in the same quality and, and uh, the standard of other people that should live. And, and that's what I, I'd love to see. Thank you so much, Dunya. And uh, Councilman Ortiz, um, I guess you'll, you'll wrap it up for us tonight. What do you think is the best thing about El Cajon and what are your closing thoughts for voters? 
the best thing about El Cajon is that we have three candidates that are SDSU graduates. I'm the third. <laughs> so either way, we're going to have an Aztec on the dais. Uh, no, in all seriousness, um, uh, I'm not going to refer to Estella or Dunia or Billy as my opponents. I think there's enough division in our country right now. And when mm -hmm. crisis starts, and it will happen at some point in El Cajon, whether it's fires um, that we experience. I was at the shooting at Santana. I know what it's like to see a community mm -hmm. together. When a crisis occurs, we're all community leaders. We're going to need to know each other and help each other and, be, and, and co coalesce together if crisis happens. And it will happen again. Um, and so I'm thankful for the three, four of us and the other candidates that really have an investment in our city. Um, I hope that the voters know that I care. Very good. I really want to thank all of the candidates for taking the time tonight to come out, to share their views, to give voters in the era of COVID a chance to, to get to know you. And, and I think we've had a really good conversation tonight. You know, one of the things about redistricting, the whole goal of it, is to make sure that each neighborhood has someone who represents them and that it isn't just, you know, five old white guys sitting up there in, in, an, in a community <laughs> that's very diverse that we get women and people of color. So I think one thing that we can definitely predict about this election is, is that uh, we are going to have some, uh, you know, diversity there representing this neighborhood. Thank you, Maria. Is. So I want to wish all of you good luck. And I want to thank the voters out there, the, the listeners and viewers who sent in some really great questions this time. And also, again, I want to acknowledge the Facebook journalism project for supporting our virtual candidate series. Now, viewers, if you tuned in later, you didn't see all of this, we will be putting a video up in a couple of days on our website at eastcountymagazine.org. It takes a couple of days to process it through Zoom and get it loaded on YouTube, but it will be there. So keep watching. And we will also put it on East County Magazine's Facebook page for you. And we'll be airing an audio, a slightly trimmed audio version of this on our radio show for KNSJ 89.1 FM. So with that, I just want to remind everybody to go to sdvote.com. Make sure you're registered to vote. It's a very important election up and down the ballot this time. And um, if you're not, get registered and remember to vote. And thank you so much for tuning in and joining us on our East County Magazine Candidate Forum for District 4. If anybody is watching from El Cajon's District 2, we'll be back Wednesday night at 7 with uh, the candidates from that race. So thanks to all of you and good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you again. Bye-bye. Good night.